The sport of mixed martial arts is full of emotion. The athletes literally put their well-being at risk to test their skills and put on a show for the fans who are sometimes incredibly brutal. The vast majority of the time when the final horn sounds, both fighters embrace to give each other credit for a job well done, acknowledging that regardless the outcome, there is a mutual respect, even after some of the most brutal beatings. Today's list highlights the fighters that displayed the exact opposite. The disrespectful, head-scratching, and at times even delusional variety to being defeated. I'm Jason from MMA on Point, and these are the 10 source losers in MMA history. Number 10, Tiki Gosen calls Lawler overrated. Back at UFC 40, a young and then undefeated Robbie Lawler took on the kickboxing and submission fighting expert Tiki Gosen, who you might actually recognize from cornering a lot of famous fighters like Rampage Jackson and some fighters even still to this day. Anyhow, in the buildup to their fight, Tiki claimed that Lawler was a bit overrated. I think he got caught up in all the and you know he's fought some you know average opponent also going on to say that Lawler would finally be fighting a mirror image of himself strong words for the six and three Gosen who had gone zero and two inside of the UFC Tiki managed to land some decent leg kicks that is before he got knocked out cold by Lawler less than two minutes into the fight the beatdown left Tiki with a massive cut over his left eye as well. During the post-fight interview, Gosen was asked if he'd like to take back his statements about Lawler being overrated, and he responded, Would I take it back? No, I got a cut. Yeah, they stopped it because of a cut. Oh. So yeah, he didn't take it back and he thought it was because of a cut. Okay, the crowd rained out boos towards Tiki as Lawler just stood there and smiled. Number nine, Benson Henderson fights like a girl. In one of the biggest fights in WEC history, Jamie Varner took on Benson Henderson to unify the lightweight titles in 2010. Henderson had won the interim belt while champion Varner recovered from injuries suffered in his title defense over Donald Cerrone the previous year. The fight itself was highly competitive with Varner most likely ahead on the scorecards throughout the first two rounds. That is until he got caught up by Benson with a guillotine choke and immediately tapped out in the third round. After the the loss a pissed off Varner took to the microphone and uttered the now famous phrase I came to fight Ben came to grapple two different things the irony here is that Varner initiated almost all the grappling exchanges and even put himself in that position to be choked during a takedown attempt and things didn't change after the fight either Varner would claim that Henderson fought like a girl and got lucky against him completely ignoring and discrediting Bendo's skill in the process surprisingly though the two would manage to bury the hatchet over time and even trained together in recent years, even considering the other a friend, but fans will never forget that post-fight speech. Number eight, shut the fuck up, mate. Back when Luke Rockhold was still the middleweight champion, he was booked in an immediate title rematch against Chris Weidman for UFC 199, but just a little over two weeks before their scheduled bout, Weidman was out with a neck injury. So who would step in but bitter rival Michael Bisping? And this was his first title challenge, a record still held to this day Day with the most UFC fights heading into a first title shot. Ruckold had submitted Bisbing with ease in their first fight, making this a foregone conclusion for many fans, but none more so than Ruckold himself. Leading up to their fight, he went after Bisbing, claiming he had no knockout power and essentially laid out how this would be the easiest title defense of his career. I'll give you a half a round, Bisbing. Half a round. He's worked his way back up the ladder. But he's going to find out there's levels to this game. And Rockhold's sentiments carried forward into the fight, throwing big shots and keeping his hands down while doing so. A fundamentalist technician like Bisbing made him pay extremely quickly and eat all those words, KOing him with his hands down only a couple minutes into round one. After this loss, Rockhold was anything but accepting of the loss, still asserting that he was the better man, acting salty in the cage. And when you watch the post-fight press conference, it single-handedly justifies the old format of them all being on the podium at once, as opposed to them being interviewed one at a time like it is now. The reason is because if you didn't know any better, you would think that this was the pre-fight press conference. I can't recall to this day a more contentious presser after a fight. Hey. You got knocked out, buddy. Sit down, shut up. You got up. lucky. First round. What an asshole, guys. Bro, bro, you suspended. Shut the fuck up. Number seven, a fake champion. One of the most dominant champions of the modern era, Joanna Janjacek, had five successful title defenses before being finished 
shockingly by Rose Namajunas at UFC 217. The former strawweight queen initially made no excuses and actually congratulated Rose on her victory on the night, but then later backtracked, claiming a horrible weight cut was to blame for her performance. And she kept making comments like this leading all the way up to their rematch at UFC 223 with Rose again retaining her title by unanimous decision. And you'd think that now maybe Joanna would admit that she was bested by a better fighter. But the fight was close and that competitive spirit Joanna has won't let her accept it. Since the loss, she's gone as far as to calling Rose a fake champion and has repeatedly declared that the judges got it wrong. Even after two defeats, she kept stating that Rose is not on her level and again blamed a difficult weight cut for affecting her. Young Jacek has relentlessly continued to call out Rose, questioning the legitimacy of her fractured neck and spinal stenosis. Sometimes the brashness and gameness of what we love about fighters unfortunately doesn't translate to taking losses humbly. Number six, Grease Gate. When you talk about big careers with legendary performances, you can't not include BJ Penn. But he's had his share of losses that weren't exactly handled well. The most famous example of this is certainly when Penn accused George St. Pierre of greasing during their welterweight title fight at UFC 94. And to be perfectly clear, to Penn's credit, GSP's corner was indeed illegally applying Vaseline to his shoulders and back. Even Dana White memorably freaked out about it at the event. Issues aside, Penn was completely dominated in the rematch to the point of his corner throwing in the towel, but he was still adamant that George had cheated. There was even a hearing in front of the commission in an attempt to change the decision to a no contest and have GSP's license completely revoked, but St. Pierre was ultimately cleared of any wrongdoing. A couple more famous instances among others stem from Penn making excuses after his decision loss to Nick Diaz, claiming that he fought like a coward against a smaller man and used cheap tactics to earn the victory. Penn also threw his former nutritionist, Mike Dolce, under the bus after losing to Frankie Edgar for a third time. Number five, don't be scared, homie. The ever popular but controversial Nick Diaz has never been one to admit defeat. The former Strike Force champ took on George St. Pierre for the UFC welterweight title in 2013, where GSP was able to neutralize Diaz and impose his superior wrestling to earn a unanimous decision victory. Following the loss, Diaz repeatedly accused Use GSP of using steroids, an accusation that Nick is still publicly saying to this day, all in a way to unrelentingly state that he still won that fight. And it still seems like Nick wants another shot when you hear him talk about it. Despite both being retired, or at least in Nick's case, seemingly retired. Prior to his matchup with GSP, though, Diaz also lost a super close decision to Carlos Conda at UFC 143, telling Joe Rogan in his post fight speech, uh, You know, I'm not going to accept the fact that this was a loss. I lost fights before where, uh, you know, like, I'm not going to accept that either, you know? Things were taken to the extreme years later when he literally attacked Joe Riggs inside of a hospital after losing to him earlier in the night at UFC 53. He also lost a bout to KJ Noons due to a cut, which he felt was a robbery. And to his defense, I don't think they should have stopped the fight either, but at least it led to the famous don't be scared, honey. quote that sparked an eventual rematch. Number four, never in the UFC again. Many fighters throughout history have falling outs with the UFC, but very few have actually received lifetime bans. And a showdown between two Octagon villains, Josh Koscheck and Paul Daly squared off at UFC 113 to determine the number one contender for GSP's wealth weight strap. I feel like we're talking about GSP a lot here. Lots of overlap. The two had bad blood going into their matchup. In my opinion, he's just a dick. And of course, both refused to touch gloves before the fight. To a hilarious reaction from referee Dan Mergliata, by the way. Just touch gloves, back up. No. no. <laughs> Although the post-fight antics are famous, the fight itself wasn't without controversy either, as Daly threw an illegal knee at Koscheck in round one that clearly did not land upon review. But Koscheck played it off like he demolished him. Josh Koscheck might want to take a look at that and uh, stand up. But the rest of the contest was one-sided with Koscheck using his wrestling to grind out a decision victory. As the final horn sounded and Koscheck was walking back to his corner, a frustrated Daly came up from behind and actually sucker punched Koscheck. A furious Mergliata restrained Daly before Bruce Buffer read off the scorecards. Daly would later go on to say that he wished he knocked out Koscheck with that late blow. Dana White made it clear that Daly would be permanently banned from the UFC for his actions, and he's never returned to the promotion. Number three, 
EPO. In an attempt to become the next UFC double champ, TJ Dillashaw dropped down to flyweight for the first time in his career to challenge Henry Cejudo for the first ESPN Plus card. There was high anticipation leading into the fight with Cejudo recently defeating longtime flyweight King Demetrius Johnson and Dillashaw being regarded as possibly the best bantamweight of all time that was coming down to flyweight to kill the division. After months of buildup, it took Cejudo only 32 seconds to TKO Dillashaw and retain his belt. TJ immediately protested the stoppage and told John Anik in the post-fight speech that he'd been punched with illegal shots and was using his wrestling to work for a takedown when the referee stopped it. Dillashaw continued to say that it sucks when something is taken from you, not when you're actually beat, discrediting Cejudo's performance and making it clear that he felt robbed. To make matters worse, TJ was later suspended by USADA for two years after testing positive for EPO. He didn't give any excuses though and fully admitted to cheating. It's definitely difficult to imagine what things will look like when his suspension is lifted because he'll already be 35 by then. Number two, attacking a referee. Remember earlier when we talked about daily sucker punching Koscheck after their fight? Well, Razi Jabbar likes to fuck shit up on another level. He took on Honorio Bonario at Universal Reality Combat Championship in 2011 and for lack of better phrasing, got completely smashed, tapping out to a flurry of strikes on the ground. So everything seems like it's normal. The fight's over, the decision is announced, then it cuts to the crowd and you look back and all of a sudden Jabbar is standing nose to nose of the referee and he tries to throw a strike but the ref sees it coming and goes immediately for a takedown shoving him to the canvas while the event promoter throws him into a rear naked choke. So for those keeping score he pretty much lost three times in one night. Once to his opponent, once to the referee and lastly the promoter. Talk about embarrassing and the epitome of a sore loser. What made this moment especially unique and hilarious is hearing corn blasting over the speakers while they tried to drown it out. That is one hell of a shit show. Number one, Ronda Rousey. No special title here. Heading into UFC 193, Ronda Rousey was riding a wave of momentum, which is something that was never seen before in MMA. She was undefeated and absolutely everywhere, appearing on talk shows, movies, writing an autobiography, and her confidence was at an all-time high. Enter Holly Holm, a soft-spoken former kickboxing and boxing champion with the preacher's daughter as her nickname. When the two clashed for the Bantamweight Championship, the world was watching and Holm was one of the biggest betting underdogs in MMA and UFC history altogether. Holm didn't only win, but she completely shut down Rousey, avoiding her grappling and sniping her repeatedly on the feet, punctuated with a second round head kick that flatlined Rousey and ended her once perceived invincible championship reign. For the next year, the once outspoken and very blunt Rousey would go into hiding, refusing to speak to the media and getting visibly upset the few times that she was asked to address the loss. She had completely changed and appeared to blame everyone but herself as the weeks and months followed, media and fans included. Ronda eventually did return to the Octagon the following year to challenge Amanda Nunes for the belt she once held, but as we all know, she got annihilated. There's no other way of putting it, losing by TKO less than a minute into the fight. And that was the last time she ever competed in MMA, and she is still to this day not spoken about either of those losses. I'd like to give a massive shout out to our social media manager turned critically acclaimed writer, Steven Jensen. You can follow him on Twitter at fight talk underscore. And I'd also like to give a shout out to Max Randall for editing this video. You can follow him on Twitter at Max underscore Randall. Thanks for watching my list, guys. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe and like. We upload at least three videos per week about MMA, and it really helps us out when you do so. If I miss anything on this vid, let me know in the comments, and feel free to follow me on Twitter at Jason the Heart, or follow the official channel account at On Point MMA. Thanks for watching so much, and I'll catch you on the next video think of when you watch MMA. Depending on who you are and how much you do watch, you might see different things. If you're a diehard fan, you'll perhaps think of some of the incredible fights over the years like Robbie Lawler versus Rory McDonald or Dan Henderson versus Shogun Hua. Perhaps you have some more obscure fights that come to mind. For fans more on the casual side,